the steps without anything. I have to have three legs, but that, that works. What a, what a joy it is to share the Word of God with you today. Uh, not happy for the situation. He is, Bill is doing well, although this morning walking, I guess some of the nerve block and all that kind of stuff's working out. And so he was having a little more pain uh, this morning. But uh, thank the Lord, it's healing up. And uh, I know he sends his love to you and would love to be here. I want you to turn to John chapter 15. And we're going to be here both this morning and tonight. This morning, we're not going to be looking a whole lot at John 15. We're looking at me glorifying God. I've got a question for you. How in the world can you glorify God? How can I glorify God? What is there about us that gives us a right to enter into the throne of grace and to the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Well, we're going to look a little bit at that. We're going to look at God. Who's God? We're going to look at who's man. And then we're going to look at the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. And I hope we can set the stage. And then tonight, uh, you're, bring, a, bring a, a, a sack lunch or a, a nighttime snack, because I've got ten points I want to bring to you tonight. <laughs> no, I won't keep you that long, I don't think. My wife just asked me to be nice to you. We were, in, uh, we were in Tennessee one time, and we went with another missionary couple out to a, a church, one of the uh, satellite churches of, uh, 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 there in, in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. And uh, the, his, the missionary's wife said, now, honey, you're going to be nice to the people tonight. And I looked at Letha, Letha looked at me, and she said, in case you, or he said, in case you wonder what she said, she wanted to know if I was going to be real short tonight. So I'll try to be kind to you tonight, even even this morning. But, uh, you know, I think we're in a, in a situation where there's a lot of me-centered things around the, the, the gospel. Me-centered around the church. I did this. How many times have you heard somebody give a personal testimony? It was everything that I did. You know, surely God uses us. But if you've ever accomplished anything in your life uh, that was good for the cause of Christ, it was because the Lord gave you the grace to do it. Amen. I appreciate the good song leading. I, I mean that. I appreciate what you all did here. Th this is beautiful. Uh, in fact, you know, I am like a thorn in front of the rose bush. But uh, I think you did a great job. I really do. And we're, uh, we're thrilled and honored to be here. I'm going to read a text uh, for you from First uh, John, or not, pardon me, but from John 15. Uh, and it's going to be verses 4 to 8. But we're not going to be uh, preaching on that right now. We'll do that tonight. But it sets the stage for what we want to look at is how in the world you and I can glorify the Lord. Now, I mean, maybe... Maybe you've got that high level of spirituality that, you know, you can just go ahead and do it. But, but when I looked at that, I looked at some of the times that God has been so faithful in, in my ministry, and I, I don't want to take any credit for anything. But, you know, I, I often wonder, why did God allow me to, to preach in a village that never heard the gospel till then? Now, I will tell you, I was in one village, and as we preached, it was at night, you know, you had one light bulb, not that bright, one light bulb over top of the stand, the pastor familiar with that kind of thing, and I'm there preaching, and you know, eloquently, oh, I mean, just fantastic, oh, all the amens all around the place, and I'm here just shouting, no, they didn't, but here comes a goat walking down right in front of the pulpit. And honestly, I, as true as I'm standing here, it looked up at me about straight out here. It goes, bah. <laughs> So I told the folk, I said, at least the goat got something out of my message. Uh, you, the rest of you could say amen. But uh, I don't think you have any goats in here. That's good. But, you know, I, I, I've often wondered. And I said, Lord, you know, I, I'm just so thankful that you have been willing to somehow use me 
And you know, each of us ought to be feeling that way. Why would God use you? Why would he use me? Well, that's what we're going to look at tonight. Beginning in verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide in me, he is cast uh, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth. Uh, pardon me, these glasses are giving me a fit, so, and then I can't read either. If a man uh, uh, abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them, cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will. It shall be done unto you. And here's the key verse of it all. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. Now over the years, I've heard a lot of people preach on that text. And it's always so winning. I think tonight we'll share with you ten things that we can do to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not all of them. That's what I'm going to give you tonight, the Lord willing. But you know, we, we've got to realize, we need to look at something. Who is God that we are to glorify Him? I'm not questioning, is God real? Who is God? You know, it was Pharaoh who thought he was a real hot shot. And when Moses said, God said, let my people go, in chapter 5 of Exodus, Pharaoh said, who is God? And then later he says, I know not the Lord. Now, you know what the book of Proverbs says? The fool has said in his heart, no God. Here was a man of great power, probably great intellect, but he was foolish. I think of the, uh, many years ago, the atheist Voltaire. He defied God. He defied the word. He made all those kind of accusations that you hear the atheists try to make about God or against God or whatever. When he died, he was a printer. When he died, his printing press was used to print the word of God. Isn't it interesting how God just changes things around a little bit? He's in control. And God knew that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. So his question was, who's, God, who's Lord? I know not the Lord. Tragic. Tragic. I have met some like that. I have met some people who, who refuse. I remember a fellow over here in York. Pastor asked if I'd go along to visit. He said, now this guy, he said, I have no idea what he'll do. He said, he has basically thrown me out of his house. He said, would you go along with me? I said, sure. We went there, knocked on the door. He came to the door, and the pastor said, this is our evangelist, Brother Fawn Miller. And, and immediately I asked him, I said, could we come in and talk to you about the Lord? He turned around, shut the door in our face, and walked right back in the house. Never had a chance to talk to him. I found out that his dad was an agnostic or an atheist, whatever you want to classify, and would not allow his son to go to church or listen to a radio preacher or any have anything to do, even the summer uh, pr uh, camp or anything like that. And so this man grew up, and now he followed in the footsteps of his dad. The tragedy, the tragedy of living a life without God. Well, let's, let's think of something that, that, you know, the populace, the populace or the, the, pe the population, just general in general, you know, they said, we, we don't believe in God. I've dealt with so many who said they didn't believe in God. But you know, the scripture is so interesting. God made it real clear. What if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the word of God of none effect? Plain words, no. God is still God. Now, let's look at some things about God. Uh, you know, we could look at a lot of 
a lot of things, but I want, to, I want to start out with this one thing. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. One of the greatest verses in all the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The first thing we find out about God is in the beginning, but then somebody will say, wait a minute, when was that? When did God begin? Well, the Bible tells us that God is from everlasting to everlasting, so he never starts. When it says in the beginning, it is talking about the time that God said, it is time now to create this world. That was the beginning. But you see, when we look, you know, and, and the interesting thing is this. When you look into the heavens, the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God, the permanent show of this handiwork, and, and, and just goes on in uh, Romans chapter 1. It tells us that God is known by his creation. I've talked with missionaries who have gone into tribes where the gospel had never been. And invariably there was somebody in that tribe that was trying to figure out what this supreme being was. They might worship a tree. They might worship a stone. They might worship whatever. But they, this individual knew that there was something more than that. And they would sit and listen as the missionary would share with them the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, beloved, it is God who desires to work and to do of his good pleasure in our lives. And you, have, you don't have anything but that God gave it to you. You remember what Daniel said to Belshazzar? Thou hast not regarded the God in whose hand thy breath lieth. He said, God has your breath right there. The day he wants to, and that night, God did it, closed his hand, and Belshazzar died. You see, beloved, God maybe puts up with a lot of things that we wonder, why in the world does he put up with it? But the simple matter is, he wants men. He's not willing that any would peri perish, but that all would come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so God will put up with a lot of things. But ultimately, there's that day. There's that day that God is going to withdraw his hand, withdraw his grace, and man's going to die without Christ. Do you remember the rich uh, farmer in uh, Luke 12? What he did, he said, I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger barns because it's such a bumper crop. That was okay. You know, farmers do that all around. You see these are plastic silos now and all that. That's the wise use of money and product. But then he said something stupid. Pardon the English. Uh, you know, I'm real sophisticated. He said, I'm going to say to my soul, take thine ease. Thou hast much goods laid up for thee. And the Bible said, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. You know, had he said, thank you, Lord, for this great bumper crop, it's not that he had to give it to anybody else. He had his own cattle to take care of. He had his own stock to take care of, his own family, servants, and whatever. But when he turned his head against God and his voice against God, God called him into an account. The second thing we want to see about God, and I guess i got to keep moving, you know, I get bogged down. We, we could spend the rest of the time on this one thing of God the creator and God the sustainer, the God who gives us life. He's omnipotent, all-powerful. You know, I think one of the greatest things that you can look at Genesis 1, 1, he created this whole world out of nothing. He didn't have a test tube and he mixed things together and said, oh, now I got it. He just spoke the world into existence. Now, we know he did it through the Lord Jesus Christ, John chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1. We know that. But God created everything out of nothing. Now, it doesn't matter if scientists can't figure that out. Just believe the Bible. But, you know, there's another place of powerfulness of, of God that always strikes, and I shouldn't say it a little bit humorous, but it always strikes me, you know, when... Moses and the children of Israel were leaving Egypt. 
they got to a predicament. Red Sea in front. I remember preaching in a, uh, well, teaching a Sunday school class. I didn't want to do it, but somebody begged me, please. And it was a, what I would call a liberal church today. It was a, a new evangelical then. I said, okay, but I'm going to say the truth. I said, whatever you do, I said, tell them right now. If their lesson is, uh, contradicts the Bible, I'll go with the Bible. And it did. It was just the children of Israel leaving Egypt, and they said they went through the Sea of Reeds, which is about six inches deep of water and muddy, sloppy. Now, my Bible tells me that all night the wind blew and the water parted, and Israel went through on dry ground with an aquarium on both sides of where they were walking. And they got the whole way through, but the interesting thing is they had a mountain to the north, a desert to the south, a sea to the front, and Egypt in behind. There was no place to go. Uh, they, 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 they were sunk. But God had a way. God had a plan. And the children of Israel went through that dry ground got to the other side, Egypt tried to come across there, Pharaoh and his horde, and they got swamped in and they became part of the aquarium. You know, it's kind of interesting. I wonder how they did swimming around with all those fish. God said, that's it. The power. You can see the Jordan where he did that with the Jordan when it was flooding its banks. But we can see so many other areas of where God was, was showing his power. There's also the thought of God's omniscience, all-knowing. You ever think about that? God knows everything. God knows everything. Uh, by the way, I, I was thinking this here. Let me give you this point. And this, this ought to be encouraging to you. God knows the very hairs of your head. And some of us are really helping him out a great deal. Uh, we don't have quite as many as we had at one time. And so God says, uh, well, okay, subtract another one. <laughs> but God knows the, the, the number of hairs. And, but the thing that's really interesting, in Psalms 147, 4 and 5, it says he knows the stars by name. Some clear night, go out and take a look up into the heavens. Look at all those stars. I remember one time we were out on a, a hunting trip out in Colorado. And uh, I'll tell you what, if you're a hunter, I encourage you to do it. We were on top of this, uh, this mountain. We were actually at that point only 6,000 feet up, but we ended up 10,000 where we hunted. But you looked out, there wasn't a thing to mar the sky, and you looked at the multitudes of stars and thought how wonderful it is. The firmament does show the glory of God. But yet God knows all the stars by name. Only gives us a few names here. Uh, in the scriptures, but he knows all the stars. In Matthew chapter 16, it says that he knows our need when? Before we ask. Think about that. He knows exactly what you're faced with. He knows what you stand in need of, and you didn't even ask. But it delights him to, for you and me to ask. You no, know, he says, call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. Just call on me. Why? Because I want to answer you. That's really what it is. Well, there's a whole lot of other things we could, uh, we could say about that. Uh, let me just give you one other thing, all-knowing. Go back to the book of Hebrews in chapter 4. Very beautiful chapter. I, I, I enjoy reading this. Read it many times just for pleasure. I don't know if you're supposed to do that, but I do. In Hebrews chapter 4, and look at verse 13. You're familiar with, with uh, 15, we, for we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. And by the way, he says, there, therefore come boldly, to the throne of grace. But I want you to go back with me to, to verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature 
that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open under the eyes of him which, with whom we have to do. Do you realize that God isn't shocked or surprised about anything? He's not. You're in a situation, do you ever think, uh, oftentimes we look at the physical end of it, and that is something to look at. You know, God isn't shocked about the physical problem you have. Or you might have. You might have a physical problem coming down the road, and I'm not wishing it on you. Uh, you know, I'll tell you, mine hit me with uh, about almost three years ago now. And I was just feeling prime, and I was in my prime, you know, three years ago. <laughs> but anyhow, you know, I, one of the things, and I know I shared this with you before, and I'm going to say it again. If you're going through some real trials and testings, Take time to read Romans chapter 8. 26 and 27 talk about prayer. 28 says that we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. And 29 says it's all done to conform us to the image of Christ. It's hard. That's a hard lesson. I'm still learning it. I mean that seriously. I'm still learning it. I'm still trying to get God to you know, to, to really get it into my mind that this is what God is doing. But God knows all people. He knows what we're going through. He's been touched with the feeling of our infirmities. So he can administer that grace and strength that we need. The other day in the hospital, I had to be in and get another shock of my heart. Uh... I think the problem is my, my wife shocks my heart too much, you know. So I have to go and get it corrected in the hospital. But anyway, no, seriously, I was in the hospital, and, uh, and uh, something was, uh, was said, and the little nurse there, she said something about, uh, uh, about life and death. I said, you know what? I'm not one bit afraid if, if I go to be with the Lord today. I said, because that's where I'm going. I'm going to heaven. She goes like this. I too. I thought, hallelujah. But you know what, dear friend? God doesn't always take us out when we're going through the hard times, but he wants to glorify his name. Now, that's something that you'll get tonight. He wants to glorify his name through your infirmity. Think of that. God says you might be real sick. You might have real pain of some kind of a situation. But I want glory for my son. And I'm going to allow you to go through it. i tell you what, we could stop there and be rejoicing for a while. But he, he has his manifold wisdom. And there's so many other things I could do that is everywhere present. You know, that's one I want to, I want to share with you. Psalms 139. This is, is, is a blessing it should encourage us, and if you're going through a trial right now, whatever kind of a trial, it doesn't make a bit of difference. Go to 139. Psalms 139, and notice what the psalmist says. Starting in verse number 7. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? Now, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of people look at this, and they think that the psalmist is trying to get away from God. That's not the point at all. He's not trying to get away from God. He's looking at life situations, no matter where you're at, when you are there. I mean, have you ever been in some particular place you knew, just knew almost nothing? I remember when Brother Kissinger and I were over in... Uh, over in, uh, in uh, Yugoslavia, what was, you, not Yugoslavia, but Czechoslovakia. Now it's Czech and Slovak. But when we were over there, we got to a road. We come up, and here was a road that said, Bruno this way, Bruno this way. Now, we wanted to go to Bruno. But we didn't know which way to go. This is a, the beautiful city of Bratislava, and, uh, and we didn't know which one. A guy come up, and we had a car that had a, a Deutschland sticker on, German sticker. And he spoke in German. Nick didn't, didn't understand it. 
So he spoke in English, plain English like anyone could speak, and told us which direction we could go, how we could get where we wanted to go, and you know what? We got where we wanted to go. We had no idea where to go. It happened about, I don't know how many times. Of course, when you have Brother Kissinger and I traveling together, you can understand that. But uh, very simply, this is a psalmist saying, wait a minute. You know, I'm going through. Uh, he, he said in verse 4, For there is not a word in my tongue, but, O Lord, uh, thou knowest it altogether. So he's not trying to get away from God, but he says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning, dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, thy right hand shall hold me. In other words, Christ, God, everywhere present. Now let's, let's think about something. I'm going to just kind of move to a little bit of something, make sure we get everything in that I would, I'd like to share with you today. But what about man? That's God. He's holy. He's altogether lovely. He's, he's everything. Like what's the songwriter say? The lily of the valley. You, you know, that's, that's Christ. He's the lily of the valley. Bright and morning star, fairest of 10,000 to my soul. There is not a, enough of time or words to talk about God. Just not. But now, Jesus Christ said, I'm to glorify God. Who am I? Well, first of all, we've got to realize that man was created by God. If you look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, or chapter 2, you find that God said, let us make man. You know, there's always something that really amazed me, and I say this to you uh, just for your thinking. Can you, do you realize that God, before eternity, before he started creating anything, he already knew everything he was going to create. But the interesting thing is, he knew when he created man, man would sin against him. Yet he created man. And the Bible tells us that before the foundation of the world, Jesus Christ was already ordained to die for our sin. Now we read in John chapter 1 that it was the word that he, all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. It's very simple that Jesus Christ created us. The Council of the Trinity, they met, they created us, knowing full well that Jesus Christ was going to have to come into this world and die on an old rugged cross and pay the price for our sin. Beloved, what love the Father has bestowed on us. Now, man is a sinner. He sinned willfully there in the garden. God provided the skins, the covering, probably a lamb, because when you come to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 29, you find out that John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. So I pointed to the day when Jesus Christ would come to this world and die for our sin. But beloved, you're a sinner, and I am a sinner, and God is holy, righteous, without sin. Now, wait a minute. How can I glorify God? Well, God wants us to glorify Him. He wanted Adam and Eve to glorify Him. And they did for however long. We don't know. But then there came that day when they sinned against God. And they went and hid themselves. And, of course, God knew where they were at. But He said, Adam, Adam, where art thou? Adam said, here I am. And he had then the action of sin. It had to be recovered. It had to ha he had to be covered for that sin and had to take blood. And the Bible tells us it's the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that cleanses from all sin. But you see, man was a sinner. Now, how can a sinner glorify God? Well, God had to do something all about that. 
You know, I think, and I'm going I'm to move ahead just to this, to John 3, and, and you know, verse 16. It's just, that is such a blessed verse. It really is. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world. Think about that. This world of sinful people, this world that has cursed God and mocked God and turned against God, and yet God so loved you and me, this whole wide world, that He gave His only begotten Son. I was telling somebody the other day, and I'm not bragging, please, please, please get this. My wife and I were over in China. We were in the home of a Communist Party individual. And his friend, who also was in the Communist Party, was there. Their wives attended a little fellowship. And they asked us to sing some of the songs of, the, of, that, of the church or of, the, of that fellowship. We did. Then one of those Communist Party men looked at, looked at the missionary and looked at me. He said, would you ask him to tell us about Jesus? You know, beloved, <laughs> that is the only name through which a man can be saved. And I had the joy of just sharing Jesus. No, it wasn't me. It was the opportunity that God had given and you see, God so loved those communist people that he wanted them to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ that they might be saved. I don't know if they got saved or not. But I'll never forget that experience. Never. I don't want to ever forget it. It is God who works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. He saves you and me because he wants us to glorify him. Now, very simply, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. Think about that. Christ had every right to condemn this world that turned against him after he created them. But he did not come into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Think about that. God's intent in sending his son into this world was that you, me, the world be saved. <coughs> and you see, beloved, it is, it is that truth that man needs to hear. You see, God is saving us, those who will come to him by faith, those who will come to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, God is saving them that they might glorify him. Now, everyone who is saved, is, is, is really, a, it's a glory to the Lord, because it's he who provided it. You know, go over to 1 Peter for a moment, and I'm kind of tying together something here. Uh, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, along with, with you and with me, we're not worthy of anything, but Christ is the one who makes us that makes us worthy or able to share the word of God, uh, not only with our with family friends, but He allows us to share the word of God that men might be saved, and yet we don't save anybody. I mean, I, I count it a privilege to be able to share the word of God. Look at verse eighteen of chapter one of First Peter. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. In other words, our salvation, our salvation to get us prepared so that we can glorify God did not come from our family, our family tree, or any uh, from our local church. It didn't come from anywhere except from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you notice it says here very simply that it is the precious blood of Christ in verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish, without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. There it is. God had planned it all out. God had planned way back 
in eternity past that Jesus Christ would die. And you know, the Lord, when in his earthly ministry, said that he had come to fulfill God's will. He knew those 33 years or so that he lived on this earth, that the whole purpose that he, that he had for being here was to die on an old rugged cross and pay the price for your sin and for mine so that this whole world might be saved. Are you telling anybody about that? Have you shared that with anybody? Now, you can't save them, but you can sure present the word of God that they might that they might understand and be saved. And then he says that, uh, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. There's another portion of scripture I want you to see. You're, you and I are sinners. Romans chapter 3 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In fact, in verse 10, we read that, uh, that there's not one righteous. No, not one. You and I don't have any righteousness in ourselves. But it, uh, Paul takes the first three chapters of Romans and lays it out very clearly that nobody is with, without excuse. Everybody is guilty before a holy God. And so, you know, there's no way that you and I can glorify God unless... We will trust in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the only covering for our sin. The Lamb of God. Now notice, if you will, as you look in Romans in chapter 3, of course, we already quoted verse 10, there's none righteous, no, not one. And then when you go over here to uh, verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The Word of God witnesses that Christ is the plan, God's plan of salvation. All our righteousness is filthy rags, Isaiah says. There's none. We're challenged in chapter 1 of Isaiah to come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be like wool. That's God doing His work in your heart and mine. The world. He said, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Meaning there's no difference between the Jew or the Greek, between you and, and anybody else. And then he says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Jesus, or Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. You see, beloved, God has provided a way of redemption. Now tonight, we're going to look at what God will allow us to do. Some of the things that He wants us to do to bring glory to Him. You see, but right now, right now as we look at this, we, you, you see that man in his sinful state, but you know how wonderful it is to go back here to Romans chapter 6. And I want to share these with you. This is what God did. God sent his son into this world, condemned to die, but he was dying for you and for me. You think about that. All that he had gone through, they tried to stone him. They tried all kinds of things to get rid of him, and he couldn't do it. Why? Because his time was not yet. Then came the time when they would take him to the cross. There they would nail him to the cross and be hanging there in shame between two thieves. But he was hanging there for you and for me. Romans chapter 6, it talks to us about, about uh, man, and he says uh, for the, in verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, God wants us to be saved. There are a whole lot of things we could talk about for the child of God, but we, first thing first, man needs to be saved. 
You know, I look back on that day, September 6, 1961, when I heard the old gospel message broadcast. I'm not a broadcast, preached right from the pulpit. In fact, many of you will know the name Dr. Oliver B. Green. That night, I heard the gospel message. It pricked my heart, and I went, and I'll never forget what I, what I said to Dr. Green. I said, I've thought all these years I was saved. I need to be born again. I'd been baptized two times, and what Dr. Green used to say, it doesn't matter if you've been baptized so many times, all the tadpoles in the creek know your name. But I was baptized twice, still lost. One time I was sprinkled, one time I was pushed under, still lost. And then there came that day, September 6, 1961, when I trusted Christ and things started to change. I mean, my life took on a new, new direction because it was the grace of God. You know, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. He says what God wants to do with you, you and me. Change our lives. That changes our mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It's, it's in, if you look at it in Philippians chapter 2. That our mind would be that of humility, allowing God to work in us. But the first thing we have to do is recognize, hey, we are sinners. And because of that sin, we are lost. Ah, oh, but then Romans chapter 10 comes into play. You know, I... I, I in fact, look over there. Look over there, and I'll read this. With this, we're going to we're going to about uh, close up shop here. But I want you to see something. Look at verse nine. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, my sometimes we make this salvation so difficult. Times you think it might might be one of the modernistic churches trying to figure out something, but look how simple it is. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. First thing is recognize who you need to come to. You need to come to Jesus Christ. That's who we need to get people to. We need to bring them to the, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Now if you go back to Romans chapter 4. He says there that Christ was was, uh, I'll, I use the word crucified. He died for our sin, but he was raised for our justification. You see, because Jesus Christ rose from the grave, he justifies us before God. That means declares us righteous. Doesn't mean we have never sinned. No, God looks at us and we have sinned. But the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. So when God sees the blood of Christ, he sees a pure, spotless individual. You might have the marks of sin on your body or whatever, but God doesn't regard those. He now regards you as a son. Read John chapter 1. And he says here, for the scripture in verse 11, well, wait, wait a minute, pardon me, verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. You see, we've got to believe that right here within our heart. I believe the night I got saved, if I could get to Jesus, he'd take care of this. I wanted to be saved. I was lost. For he says, for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Isn't that wonderful? God is rich unto all. Why? Do you know what? When you receive Jesus Christ, you're made an heir and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Everything that heaven has is yours. Or you don't put it in your back pocket. No. You get to enjoy it before the Lord forever. So how do you get that? Verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, God provided a way that you and I can glorify Him. He did it through His Son, that He might redeem us from all iniquity 
and present us to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. You know what, when God looks at me, as much flaws as there is, you know, I might stand in a mirror and say, boy, ain't you just a wonderful guy? But no, God, God sees what I am, and the only thing I can do is stand before the Lord and say, Lord, you've done it all. You've given me this life. And beloved, that same action that God did in my life, he'll do in yours. Because he's no respecter of persons. We're to glorify God. We've already talked about who God is. We've talked about man. The only way we can glorify him is by being born again. Knowing him. I challenge you to read 1 John 5, 9 through uh, 13. It would be a great, great help to you. But realize that because of what Jesus Christ did there on the cross of Calvary, because of what the Lord Jesus Christ does in our lives day by day, you and I can be vessels that can glorify the Lord. Is your heart right with God today? Heads bowed, eyes closed. Just a moment, Ray will be coming and leading us in a song, but I want to ask you this question. Is your heart right with the Lord? Could you say without a shadow of a doubt, I know that my sins have been forgiven. I know that Jesus Christ has given me eternal life. If you can't say that, then I would ask you to please come. Please come here and give us the opportunity to take the Bible. It's not what I think, it's what the Bible says. And we want to help you. There's others here that would be more than happy to help you and see that you know the truth that will set you free. We're dealing with a holy God. We're dealing with a holy Savior. And we're dealing, it, dealing with them as a human being who's been born again. Have you been born again? If we might be of help to you, please give us that privilege. Father, we only can say thank you for the word of God, for the person of Jesus Christ. Father, we can only say thank you for you, how you love us. You love us with an everlasting love. You love us so much you sent your only begotten son to this world that he might die for our sins. Lord, if there's somebody here in the service or hearing in some way by the internet or whatever, Lord, would you speak to their hearts and draw them unto yourself that they might be saved. And for each of us who love thee and know thee, help us to be faithful to thee every day. Would you bless in Jesus' name, amen.